Um, we've got Vida Hallen, who's the curator of the exhibition starting at zero and um, uh, from Norway. Um, uh, he, he was in charge of the Design Museum, worked with the National Museum. He's going to be creating the exhibition in ARCS. We've got Magdalena Droster from the Bauhaus and, and Veronica, who's from, from Prague. And we'll talk a little bit about the Czech links to some of these artists, which is, which is wonderful. Um, and please do have any questions. This is your chance before you go around the exhibition, which is on the ground floor. Um, it's a very beautiful exhibition of four, for me, incredible artists um, who also tell the story a little bit of arcs. And we're, we're delighted. We also want to thank the Tukentap Villa that it is here. Um, and then we're seeing whether it goes to Prague and then it will in May next year be permanently in, in Brunionets as, as an exhibition through art. You can see the lives of these people. So we'll, we'll just spend a little bit of time. We're at maximum half an hour, but I just want to give a chance as well for you to hear some of the things that go into a real museum. And I'm just going to ask some questions, first of all, of, of, of Vida. Um, Vida Hallen, if you could just, what is Starting at Zero? What is it about? If you could just introduce the exhibition to starting people. Starting at Zero is a quote from Annie Albers. She said that everyone should have the chance to start at zero once in life. And that is probably true. And she always uh, emphasized that for her students, particularly art students, uh, that they shouldn't be too much into traditional things, that they should not look too much to the past, but that they should start from zero themselves. And of course, uh, weaving is a start from zero every time with the thread. And so with Lucy Rie, with starting for zero with the pot, with the piece of clay, she also started from zero every time she made a famous work. And she probably never realized that her works would be so famous because today they are, and they are also incredibly valuable. We probably shouldn't mention how valuable <laughs> since they are now exhibited here, but they go up in 10,000s of euros and they really are a fantastic objects of art. So these four artists all wanted to start at zero. Annie Albert managed very well. She and Joseph Albers were invited by the people around the Museum of Modern Art in the United States and the Rockefeller family. And they were greeted very nicely there and they got, uh, Annie got her job at Black Mountain College and became one of the greatest artists of the 20th century in the Western world. Um, Otti Berger, who <coughs> did work here, uh, also in Prague, she was a good friend of Slava Vandrochkova, and her brother worked at uh, Rosenbaum Fashion House, whom Eva Utsalova, who is here today, has written a very nice book about. And she's also written about Otti's uh, brother Otto, who was a fashion designer at Rosenbaum. And she came here every year uh, to meet them um, on her way to her family. So Otti was uh, also a Bauhaus, educated Bauhaus, like Annie Albers was. They were contemporaries, and um, they both worked on the new textiles for the new architecture. The new architecture for which we see here, the white cube, the rather stern interiors, the rather uh, harsh interiors in a way, and they understood that to make these interiors human and warm, you needed new textiles. You needed the good textiles that could absorb the sound, absorb the light with these huge windows. You needed uh, carpets that were warm and pleasant for the children to play on. And we have told that actually they did do that here at Villa Tugendhat. The children always played in the main room in front of the Onyx Hall wall on that beautiful carpet, which we will unveil later on. And they realized that they had to make new textiles. So, so they did, and they were asked to do for industry to develop the German industry. And uh, all of them did that for a long time uh, until uh, 36, uh, the, in May 36, uh, Hitler banned all Jews and all foreigners to work in Germany, and Otti had to move on and find work all around the world. She traveled extensively, probably more than any other Bauhaus person, to all the countries, Stockholm, Amsterdam, 
if she was in, even in Oslo, in Norway, and in Bergen. She had family from Bergen. Um, and she was in uh, <coughs> Amsterdam working for the plug company in Paris. She wanted to work with Sonia Delanay first. She corresponded with Adolf Loos about that. And later on, she wanted to work at Rodiers, but nothing came of it, unfortunately. And then to Zagreb, Budapest, she traveled to Prague and to London, where she worked for a few months only in the factory and then felt that she had to go home. Her mother was ill, this was in 38. Her good friend Ludwig Hilbersheimer left to the States uh, and she went home to visit her mother and she was going to come afterwards to the States, she said. There they had founded the new Bauhaus. All the big masters from the Bauhaus had founded the new Bauhaus and she could not get out then from Croatia. Uh, because um, she, could, she did get a uh, visa, in fact, from the American consulate, but the, the Yugoslavian government would not give her a new passport. And they were, as you know, collaborating with the Nazis, so she, they didn't give her a passport, and she was sent to Auschwitz with the rest of her family. So a rather sad story. But Lili Reich had a better life in many ways, Magdalena. Um, you tell us now about Lili Reich. Hello together. I'm happy to be here in this uh, monument of modernism and uh, want to give you some more information about uh, Lili Reich. She was an interior architect and we can say she was together with Mies van der Rohe. She formed a creative couple. So we may learn about destructive couples who do not support each other. And we may learn about um, cooperative couples which uh, help each other in creativ creativity. So she was a tough woman, having uh, starting her career as a designer uh, when this was not usual but possible, especially for women who came from better families as she did. And for about 10 years, from 1909, 10 to the 1920s, she worked on display. So for the new warehouses, so you can imagine the warehouses offered new possibilities of offering goods and buying goods. So for clients, this was a wonderful chance. Uh, and now we see the decline of the warehouses, yeah? So, but Lili Rai's career started with the beginning, with, with the career of the warehouses, yeah? Uh, so she learned to do display, especially with textiles. And display was a way of uh, arti artificial work which today is no longer important. But in these days, in the beginning 20s, in the 10 years, so 1910, 1920, to know about a display was fundamental because it was one of the new abilities to deal with space, to deal with big photos, and to, yeah, let's say to, to organize a way for the visitors through the through exhibitions, etc. These were all new possibilities for architects, and this was one of her strong sides. So in the early 20s, she met the upcoming architect Mies van der Rohe. No one of them had really a name in the history of avant-garde. And Mies was to do his way a bit earlier than she, because he made so many radical manifestos. Today, a manifesto, nobody cares about it, yeah? But in the 20s, an uh, artificial manifesto was important and was taken serious, especially in the realm of architecture. So, since 23, 24, they became a couple, which was not without difficulties, because Mies was married, 
but never divorced. And he had with his wife three children, all girls. So, and this will accompany her story till to the end. Uh, he never divorced. In the end, he went in exile without his family, but also without Lili Reich. So, how does the story go on? Since 27, or between 27, 1927, 1937, they worked together as a creative couple doing exhibitions. And for the first time, Mies van der Rohe did interior design. And all these interior designs were done together with her. And only in the last years, we see and we try to find out what was her part in this interior, research, interior design, what was his part. So both had, a, had different abilities, but both agreed in their aesthetic uh, uh, decisions. So they appreciated each other. We know they discussed each other. This has to be like this, this has to be like this. And together they developed a very strong aesthetic. And the high point of this aesthetic is this house. My research, and you, you all know you are here why, because this house is world famous, because the architects are world famous, because the uh, stories around this house are world famous. And in interior, interior design is one of the qualities for the excellence uh, of this house, of this interior, of this surroundings. And just by the way, here you see, a thing which never is discussed much, you will see in the inside as well, how space, space in itself, how space is a luxury, yeah? You will see it. Okay, just for your observations when you walk around and enjoy the space and inside space is a luxury as well, yeah? One doesn't often talk about that, but I think it's important to see it as a luxury. Okay, my latest research referred to the carpet, to the white carpet, and I think afterwards we will see a rewoven carpet. And me and my colleague Laura Martinez de Guerra from Spain, uh, who is doing research on Mies and Lili Reich in, in the Barcelona pavilion in uh, Barcelona, uh, we found out, or we did together research on the weaver of the of that carpet, whose name is rather unknown, Alain Müller-Helrich. She was a German weaver, and she was very ambitious, and she developed this way of uh, weaving um, with uh, specially treated wool. So the wool was not colored, it was white wool. The wool was uh, not washed before they spun, they spun, 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 okay. And then it was done by hand, so there would have been machines to do it. Uh, and then it was hand woven and not me mechanically woven. All that would have been possible, but there was a broad movement of reactivating handicraft for design. And we could uh, reconstruct the story, uh, how the commission was given to her, how uh, Lili Reich and she came together. When did she first exhibit her new designs? But we also found out that the decision to make a unicolor white, white carpet, which today is a matter of fact, and nobody looks if a carpet has only one color or has a design and ornaments. But in these years, a radical white color of a carpet for a carpet was a kind of sensation, yeah? So, so you can really write, you can pick out one detail and write its history. Okay. How do I go on? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep, uh, okay. <laughs> 
Okay, this was a high point also for the career of Reich and Mies. Uh, yeah, man could go on with the tapestry stories, how they continued as well, but I will go on with the biographies. Third Reich began. Uh, everybody tried to adapt to the new conditions, but the new uh, governors around Hitler, they did not really want this modernism only in, in some special fields, so in factory building perhaps, in industry, but not in representative design. They did not want this style, yeah? And there were too many Jews for them, and uh, they wanted to control everything. Um, so they wanted really uh, totale Macht, total power. So Mies saw that he couldn't couldn't uh, have, have further success, couldn't continue his career. And there were economically very, very bad years for Germany. Yeah? Uh, and in 38, he traveled several months through the United States to organize where he could get a job. And as he was such a prominent architect, uh, there were several uh, parties who wanted him, who made him offers. So one was Chicago, the other was, uh, I'm not sure, was it Yale? Uh, and especially the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, but in the end, he went to Chicago after having uh, dealt with that, about that, months, 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 yeah? And then he went back to Germany and organized his uh, Exile, so prepared everything. Lili Reich did not exile. I once asked one of her colleagues, of our students, I said, Herr Hirsche, why didn't, but didn't she exile? He said she had no job in the States. And of course, many of these exiles, they had to find a job, an opportunity to, to get paid, yeah? Uh, she didn't have that. And I think, yeah, okay. So she stayed, and she did a lot of the administration. So the couple did not really separate. I think he separated more from her. She, you see, you feel it in the letters. Uh, she had a big affection for him still, and she did everything for him he wanted and which was necessary. So we have these letters. Each week she wrote him a letter talking about how she had administrated his uh, jetzt habe ich das Wort schon wieder license licenses for his uh, steel furniture uh, there were processes but when there was bad furniture there were uh, uh, raubkopien bad copies bad copies uh, so they had to, had to forbid them so there was never ending trouble around that but in the end so income declined and she had to to deal his money because at that year in these years uh, a woman was not allowed to have its own her own bank account so lily reich uh, gave the money from me to the woman of to to me's wife and to another uh, mistress. mistress of of me and often she complained in her letters yeah so we do not know much about her private life because her apartment, the house is still existing, but the house was bombed in 44 or 45, I forgot, and everything was lost. But before, her private things, but before that, so you, you saw the bombs coming and falling, she had thought of me, and of Mies had left his archive in the States, in, in Germany, and they had collected everything and brought it, to, and some designs of her in those, well, in those uh, cases where they had worked together. So, and they brought these, uh, these packages uh, to a place in East Germany in, uh, Mühlhausen, yeah, to the father of a Bauhaus student, where the things were kept safe until the, I think, 70s. And then they were brought from the United States, from East Germany to the United States. So they were safe, and but her things 
were lost. So you are happy when you find a private letter of uh, of Lili Reich. And now I learned there are still some private letters between her and another person. But I did not yet find access to it. Okay, so research goes on. And uh, you can take part in it. You see, uh, at each corner, you can uh, invent something or find something. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yes. And I'll just add one thing. We're going to. We're going to put back the carpets, which we've rewoven with Kubak, and very much thanks to Magdalena's research, we'll come back at two o'clock. Now we talk to uh, um, now we must talk to Veronica Supakova from Prague, and she's also doing research. And for all of you students here, this kind of research is really fascinating. I can highly recommend it. You will have a very good life if you become an art historian. We have traveled all over the world doing exhibitions everywhere, and we have had a terribly good life with our <laughs> studies, haven't we? So it's recommended. It doesn't give you all the money you need in life, but it gives you a happy life. So Veronica, you are actually now studying Slava Vondraskova, who was a very fascinating textile <laughs> artist and designer in uh, Prague, and she was a very close friend of Otti Berger. <laughs> they met at Bauhaus, Slava did not study there, but she went with the famous um, artist and architect he was as well, wasn't he, Karl Teiger, yeah. to uh, the Bauhaus, where he actually lectured. He was a good friend of the Bauhaus uh, director, Hannes Meyer, and he lectured there a couple of years, 29 to 30. And that is how we became in contact. And this is also one of these marvelous things about studying these kind of things, is that you get friends all over the world, and uh, you get uh, to write to people all over the world. And so we started our research together on these two artists. Thank you very much for introduction and thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here alongside Vidar and Magdalena, uh, which, uh, who are my uh, mentors and a big inspiration in my research. As uh, Vidar already said, um, I'm uh, in the middle of uh, my research on uh, Jaroslava or Slavka Vondráčková. Uh, she was a textile artist, uh, designer, but she was also a very keen uh, writer um, and also an archivist. Uh, she collected um, many materials, uh, many information and archival documents. And that, that's how we uh, got in touch with Vidar, thanks to Eva Uchalová from uh, the Museum of Decorative Arts in Prague. And we started to uh, develop uh, the connection between uh, Slavka Vondráčková and Oty Berger uh, from the scope of uh, Czechoslovak textile designer Jaroslava Vondráčková was the only one who uh, somehow um, managed to um, connect to Bauhaus uh, textile workshops um, and um, uh, they uh, get uh, they got in touch with Otto Berger, and Vondráčková wasn't a student at Bauhaus, but uh, she went there several times alongside Karel Taige from uh, uh, at the very end of uh, the twenties, and um, then uh, she and Otto started to cooperate, and they basically invite uh, invented. Um, uh, some of the artificial materials uh, they work together with, um, for example, asbestos or um, yeah, or that's not an artificial material, but viscose was also very important uh, material to her. Um, uh, both yeah, cellophane yeah. Both of them uh, li liked to work with uh, wool because, um, as uh, was also already said, it makes uh, very uh, interesting, very fascinating structures. And um, as I said, Vondráčková was also uh, keen on writing and archiving everything. So um, she always remembered um, that Otti Berger taught her how to work with the, with the structure and with the light-absorbing light materials and um, that um, 
she admired how Otti uh, worked with um, worked with uh, the tactile sensations. That's that's uh, the uh, the words she uh, was using. So um, so yes, yeah, so they uh, were cooperating together and um, Slava Vondráčková was also very important for Oti during the years of exile because um, uh, Slava uh, and uh, her friend, uh, Czech uh, translator, uh, Mica Wedderall, who married um, a professor from Eton, helped Oti, or they were trying to help her uh, to get a passport uh, through uh, Duke of Windsor, who probably, um, Mitza Vetterl probably asked uh, Duke of Windsor, we are not so sure because um, Mitza Vetterl uh, burned all of the letters from this time, so that's also a part of um, an art historian's job <laughs> to, uh, to make some um, uh, some connection and uh, conclusions and hypotheses. So that's uh, what um, what we found out that uh, Mitza probably asked the Duke of Windsor to um, help uh, through Hitler to help Otte to get a to get a passport. Um, he was living in Paris then, the Duke of Windsor. Yeah, Duke of Windsor was living in Paris back then. Yeah, so um, Slava Vondráčková is not uh, very well known in uh, in Czech Republic yet, but uh, she was a fascinating uh, person, fascinating uh, textile artist and, and a writer. And what's also interesting is that we have um, in Czech Republic uh, two uh, big archives of uh, Slava Vondráčková full of um, interesting, fascinating letters, but also her own memoirs, uh, where she mentioned um, um, details from her life, from the connections uh, between her and Bauhaus. It was not only about um, her connection to, or her um, a contact with uh, Otte Berger, but also uh, she was in touch with Hannes Meyer and later with his wife. And in the late 60s, she was also in touch with uh, Hans Maria Wingler, the uh, founder of Bauhaus Archive. And she was, um, she was collecting, um, um, collecting memories of uh, Czechoslovak uh, or the uh, Bauhaus students from Czechoslovakia. Uh, she was collecting them and um, trying to reach out to them and asked, uh, for example, Irena Bluhová, uh, a Slovakian photographer, uh, if she um, has anything, any photos. And uh, she actually found out a photo of Otte Berger. Uh, alongside two students from Bauhaus that I sent to uh, Vidar. And yeah, so she asked um, all of the students that were alive at that time from Bauhaus, from Czechoslovakia, uh, for, the, uh, for their memories uh, on Bauhaus. And then she uh, passed it to Hans Maria Wingler and uh, she did uh, an uh, exhibition in Stuttgart in the late 60s. And um, that must have been a great help for uh, him uh, regarding the Czechoslovakia and the connections, uh, the links between Czechoslovakia and, and Bauhaus. Um, yeah, she, she really was an uh, interesting um, person and uh, she lived uh, throughout the whole 20th century because she died in uh, 1986 and uh, she was, uh, I think, 91 years old. So uh, she really lived um, whole life. Uh, she um, uh, witnessed uh, um, she witnessed um, many uh, many events and also uh, the big change of political situation. Um, yeah, so that, that's maybe all <laughs> from me. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> and uh, just we have to close now, but as you see, there's a lot of research going on, but 
as we know, with these textiles, so many of them have disappeared. They are the most fragile things that we produce in our culture. And so much just disappears or have been thrown away. Or when you change the, uh, the fabric on the furniture, you throw it away, but you should never do that. You must let it stay underneath and put the new one on the top. So remember that always, because in the future, it may be that this is a very important textile. <laughs> And today we are looking for them like crazy from the 30s to find these fabrics. And we have very few of Slava Vondraskova. You have some here in the Museum of Decorative Art here. There are exhibited some nice uh, samples of Slavska Vondraskova's uh, um, textiles. And I'm hoping to get into the Spielberg uh, collection also <laughs> one of these days. There, there may be somewhere. So we, we are still working at it. But remember, if you hear of it, look in your attics, look everywhere, or <laughs> ask your grandparents if they have some, because we are all looking for those fabrics. So, uh, and we all want to uh, bring them into light, all these artists that wanting to start, that started at zero, and today have developed into world famous people whom we still uh, admire and are still looking up to. Thank you so much.